Good morning, everybody. This is George from DinosaurGeorge.com, filming inside today because it's nasty outside. Let's get into it. Philip from Gainesville, Virginia. Hello, Mr. Blessing. I'm a huge fan, and I hope you're doing well. Well, thank you, Philip. That's very kind of you. Uh, I am doing well. I hope you and your family are doing well as well. Two questions. My first is, since Megalania is a giant monitor lizard, and monitor lizards are the most intelligent reptiles today and are trainable, do you think Megalania was this intelligent? You know, Philip, I know that monitor lizards are intelligent. Sometimes, though, when we talk about being trainable, I think we we sometimes apply intellect to being trainable, and that's not necessarily the case. You don't have to be smart to react to food, and in almost all cases, we train animals with food. So an animal like, uh, Meg, uh, like a modern monitor lizard is, is certainly will do things for us, but it's not because it has a high intellect. It's because it's doing it because it knows at the end it's going to get food. Now, animals like dogs, who do have a much higher intellect, I think they have the ability to grasp these things in a much broader scale, and they can do a lot more things on their own. So I don't know if I would necessarily apply a high level of intellect to a monitor, but I don't think you're doing that, Philip. I think it's very clear what you're saying here. I think what you're asking is, is uh, do I think Megalania, Megalania was as intelligent as a monitor, no matter how intelligent a monitor is? So I, I, the only reason why I put that in there, Philip, is I don't want people to think that you can go out and buy a monitor lizard and teach it to jump through hoops and fetch and all that kind of stuff. It'll fetch, but it'll, it'll fetch your little brother or sister and eat them. So <laughs> with Megalania, I, I do believe he certainly had enough intellect to survive, and sometimes that's all it takes. Um, to grow that big and to be able to survive means it had to figure out ways to capture its food. And when you're big, you require more food than when you're small. So he certainly was very intelligent. I would suspect that probably was as intelligent as a modern day um, monitor lizard. His second question was, can you tell me about Bruhathkiosaurus? You know, this is a very interesting dinosaur, Philip, and I've not stayed up with it. When it was first discovered, it was announced to be a gigantic sauropod that may very well be the biggest sauropod that ever walked planet Earth. It appeared to be huge. But then another paleontologist looked at the evidence and said, this is not a fossilized limb bone. This is a tree. You're looking at a fossilized tree. So it's gigantic size. Of course it's gigantic. It's as big as a tree, because <laughs> it's a tree. But then somebody else, if I understand correctly, looked at it and um, reevaluated the evidence and said, no, this, this belongs to a gigantic sauropod. That's kind of where it left with me. I, I stopped paying attention to it then, and I haven't really researched it. So many of you that watch these videos, I know you guys are up to date on a lot of things, and I say guys, keep in mind everybody, I say guys about everything. I don't mean you you men. I'm talking about you people. Um, you guys have a much bigger grasp on some of these things. Post some of your answers if you've heard anything different. By the way, while I'm talking, just to let you know, because a lot of you are going to ask who this is, this is uh, Raptor Rex. This is a skull of Raptor Rex, the um, early predecessor to Tyrannosaurus Rex. All right, Matthew from Lake Oswego, Oregon. If orcas and megalodons were competing for food, would they have fought each other and who would win? Interesting question, Matthew. I believe that orcas and megalodons live together, or at least the early version of orcas. I believe they live together. So certainly I think they would have come in contact with each other and they would have competed. Orcas, of course, have that great mammalian brain, which gives you much greater intellect. And that is very efficient when it comes to outthinking your opponent. Megalodon, on the other hand, doesn't necessarily need a big brain because he's as big as a bus or bigger. So he relies solely on brute force and reaction. I believe that if there was a pod of orcas, meaning a group of orcas, then certainly they would have been capable of either preoccupying Megalodon so that the others could steal the food, or they could have driven him away because they would have been much more maneuverable, I believe. So if they did live together, and I think they did, I believe orcas would have been successful. In fact, it could be possible that orcas may have ultimately led to the extinction of Megalodon. Maybe he couldn't compete with these grand mammalian brains. I just don't know for sure. All right, Vladis from Riga, Latvia. Vladis says, who would win in a fight between Smilodon or Utah Raptor? Very interesting. Now, keep in mind, Vladis, these animals never came in contact. They lived millions and millions and millions of years apart. They never saw each other. But if they did, 
for the sake of this question. This is kind of cool. Uh, well, let's size up Utah Raptor. He's got certainly six massive claws on his hands. He has that huge recurve kill, killing claw on his foot. Easy for me to say, killing, killing claw. And uh, he's got those recurved uh, serrated edge teeth, which gives him a nasty array of weaponry. Now we look at Smilodon, who's got speed, who's got endurance, who's got that mammalian brain, and who's got those gigantic canine saber teeth, and of course, he's got front and back feet loaded with weapons, uh, razor sharp claws. So if these two animals met, I think Smilodon may have an advantage, may have an advantage, because he may have been a little more agile and had the ability to turn a little bit quickly, uh, more quickly than a uh, Utah Raptor. So I think what that means is he could get around behind Utah Raptor very quickly and jump on his unprotected back and dispatch of him uh, pretty quick. Now, of course, this is all simply speculation. Everybody can have their own opinions. It's just that my opinion is much grander than everyone else's. All right. <laughs> All right, Andrew from Las Piñas, the Philippines. Hi, DG, how are you? I'm good, Andrew, how are you? I'd just like to ask you, how did Tyrannosaurus evolve and spread out? Thank you. Well, Andrew, here's part of your answer. Tyrannosaurus started relatively small and there was a whole series of early ancestors. Um, what were the two ancestors that they found? Oh my gosh, I can't believe I just forgot their name. Wow. Uh, Guanlong and die long. Those guys are early ancestors. Basically, they start off with a little more slender body, and as they change over time, they become a little more robust. This is an example of a very robust dinosaur. I don't know if you guys can see this very well, but as you can see, uh, he's got a relatively robust skull. If you compare this size skull, this is about the size of the skull of Deinonychus, and yet this is considerably heavier. He's a much heavier duty dinosaur. So basically, as they're changing, as their environment changes, they, they're becoming more heavy. They're becoming heavier, not more heavy. They're becoming heavier. They're becoming more robust. And as they spread out, basically, they're simply following uh, food sources, Andrew. They're following where the food is going. And as the food goes into new environments, the animals that rely on those plants begin to change because the environment's a little different. Well, you see the predators kind of following suit and changing as well. So what starts off small and thin becomes heavy and robust and then becomes gigantic and sheer titanic, and they are monsters. And that's basically how we ended up with Tyrannosaurus rex. Pete from Detroit, Michigan, is Spinosaurus and Baryonyx and Suchomimus related, and do they eat fish? Pete, to the best of my knowledge, yes, they are. Spinosaurus, Suchomimus, Baryonyx, uh, Irritator, and who else? Uh, Megaraptor are all members of that same family. They're all related to one another, and um, it does appear that they are suited for catching and eating fish. Now, that might, I, again, I don't want to upset the Spinosaurus fans out there because I, I always make it seem like Spinosaurus isn't a, a monstrosity. Man, he would swallow you and I whole. So, but they still appear to me to be better suited for catching fish. And that's what I think they probably did. And so it might be realistic to believe that all members of that family, the ones I named, certainly would have been fish eaters. They sure were, in my opinion, uh, designed for that. Finally, Peter from Zagreb, Croatia. Hi, Dinosaur George. First, I want to say that I'm a big fan of yours. Well, thank you, Peter. That's very kind of you. And uh, he says, ever since I was a kid, I've liked dinosaurs, and I've been following your work on the internet for several years. Well, great, Peter. Thank you very much. I hope, uh, I hope you've enjoyed uh, watching some of the stuff. Okay, my question is, some scientists say Tyrannosaurus rex had bacteria in his teeth, and if T-Rex bit his victim, the animal would die from an infection, something like a Komodo dragon. I just want you to know, I'm very honored if you read this, and I'll be happy to know, I'd be happy if you would answer it, because it bothers me for some reason. Thank you. Well, Peter, thank you very much, and I'm glad I am able to answer this. Did Tyrannosaurus rex have bacteria on his teeth? That has all been speculation at this point because we've not been able to look at the teeth and find evidence that I'm aware of, any evidence that absolutely proves it. But by looking at the teeth and by looking at the design of the tooth, there are certainly, uh, there's every reason to believe that's the case. When you look at a Tyrannosaurus rex and you see those serrations, each serration at the bottom of the downward part of the little serration has a little cup-like uh, feature. 
it would have been perfectly suited for holding on to little pieces of meat and drops of blood that would have sat on the teeth. And as we all know, if we don't brush our teeth, it doesn't take long before bacteria simply cover all of our teeth. And Tyrannosaurus Rex, of course, didn't brush his teeth. And so he would have had a mouthful of bacteria. It then goes to, to Komodo dragons who have that vile, vile kind of bacteria that literally in the life of whatever it bites. And so it's, it's not a stretch at all to believe Tyrannosaurus Rex was the same way. So in my opinion, Peter, I absolutely believe that a bite from a Tyrannosaurus Rex would have been septic. Look, a bite from another human can become infected very quickly. And we brush our teeth, or at least some of us do. <laughs> but um, uh, we brush our teeth, and yet we still have bacteria in our mouth. So, yeah, you get bitten from a Tyrannosaurus Rex. First, there's blood loss, there's trauma, there's shock. But on top of that, in my opinion, I think there would have been a very, very nasty infection. And it's the last thing you would have wanted after being bitten by that guy. All right, everybody, that's it for now. If you've got a question, go to my website, dinosaurgeorge.com. Click on the Ask Dinosaur George page. Fill out the form and submit it. Keep in mind, we get so many of these, we can't answer them all. Uh, for you young people out there, Always practice your reading because it's very important. And for everybody, I always, always, always appreciate the good manners and the respect. And I appreciate um, you guys being so kind and courteous. Please be like that to everybody and it would make the world a whole better place. I'll see you 